Um, my name is Cindy Arnson. I'm the director of the Latin American program here at the Wilson Center. Um, and uh, I'm delighted um, to host all of you and our distinguished panelists, along with my colleague Jose, Jose Raul Perales um, of the Latin American program. I'd like to um, especially thank Nikki Nichols um, of the Latin American program staff, as well as Adam Drolet, um, an intern here with us uh, on loan, or not exactly on loan, but currently pursuing his master's studies at, uh, at Georgetown. Um, for his assistance. Um, if people need headsets, translation mostly from Spanish into English, um, one of our panelists, Joel Brito, will be speaking in Spanish, so we invite you to uh, grab a headset or put up your hand and we can um, pass them around. He will, will we'll have the panelists speak in the, um, in the order uh, in, um, in which they are seated. Um, for purposes of introduction, again, you have bios in front of you. I'll start at the far end. Um, Ignacio Sanchez um, is a member of the Woodrow Wilson Center Board, um, and he is a senior partner at DLA Piper here in, uh, in Washington. Um, next to him is, um, is Joel Brito, um, executive director of the Grupo Internacional para la Responsabilidad Social Corporativa in Cuba, um, one of uh, uh, the foremost labor activists um, uh, in Cuba or, or regarding Cuba. Um, next is Steve Riker, the communications director of the National Tour Association, who will have a lot to say about, you know, drunken college students on the, <coughs> on the beach or not, or not. Um, and then finally, um, I'll introduce Chris Garza um, to my immediate left with a little more detail. He, um, his bio was inadvertently um, omitted from the bio sheet, our uh, editorial mistake for which we apologize. Um, Chris is the senior uh, director of congressional relations um, at the U.S. Farm Bureau. His portfolio includes bilateral and uh, regional trade negotiations, um, food issues, as well as sanctions reform. Um, he has been working on the Cuba issue for the last 10 years and has been um, key at leading the discussion within the U.S. Um, agricultural sector. So we will start with Chris, the same rules. Um, we'll ask panelists to speak for 15 maximum of 20 minutes in order to uh, allow for a full exchange um, with uh, our audience. Thank you. Chris. Thank you very much. And I um, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all this afternoon on the issue regarding opening up trade or at least allowing U.S. trade into Cuba. Um, this issue has been very critical to the American Farm Bureau, obviously as an agricultural organization, one that produces all commodities grown and produced here in the United States. We are always looking out for new market opportunities. Um, prior to 2000, we were unable to sell any agricultural goods to Cuba. Um, and then in 2000, Congress passed the Trade Sanctions Reform Act, um, which finally allowed U.S. agricultural products and medical goods to finally be able to be sold into the Cuban market. Um, Farm Bureau, as an organization, we do have policy um, on our books, basically, that um, basically states that we oppose economics or that we oppose sanctions, that we oppose the sanctions that are on Cuba. But obviously, understanding the politics that revolve around the issue, uh, we know that now is probably not the time to kind of be pushing on lifting of the entire embargo. But what we are looking at is easing those restrictions, again, that are put in place on our exports into the market. And while the Trade Sanctions Reform Act of 2000 did open up the market to us, it did also place restrictions on how we sold products into the market. Um, as far as U.S. agriculture goes with Cuba, um, we are not viewed as a reliable supplier um, because of the restrictions and the ability of the U.S. government to come in and change our regulations as far as we sell at a whim. And we kind of saw this in, in 2005 when OFAC changed the rules on cash payment in advance, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, you know, our competitive disadvantage in the Cuba market is not a result of partner-imposed trade reasons. You know, whenever we're doing trade with the country, usually we are affected by barriers that are put in place by the country that we are trying to import into, whether they be tariff restrictions or sanitary, phytosanitary restrictions, and those are animal plant health issues or other non-tariff trade barriers. But in the case of Cuba, um, our competitive disadvantage is actually put in place 
by our own government. They are our own government imposed restrictions. Um, U.S. agricultural's goal overall is to be the supplier of choice for Cuba. Um, and it makes perfect sense, um, given the proximity of the country um, to the United States and given where our major food exporting ports are, um, we should be the, the country that is providing the most food into Cuba. But unfortunately, at this time, uh, we are seeing our competitors like Canada, the European Union, Brazil, Argentina, and even countries as far away as Vietnam feel the need for food um, within Cuba. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we should be the, the preferred supplier, but we are not. Um, and given Cuba's agricultural production and that it does not meet its own food demands of the nation, they have to import product. They are a food, they are a net food importer. Um, so Cuba must do this in order to make sure that its citizens do not go hungry. And obviously, as an exporting country, we want to be able to fill that need um, for Cuba. On average, the United States has exported roughly about $320 million in U.S. products since being allowed to ship into the market in 2000. Um, we have exported a variety of products, including corn, wheat, soybeans, rice, poultry products, pork, dried beans, fresh fruits and vegetables, apples, grapes. So you can kind of see that it is a large swath of production that is here in the United States. But prior to 2005, we did see our imports increase almost double every year. Um, but since 2005, we have seen ourselves significantly fluctuate from very highs to very lows. Um, looking at the sales from last year um, compared to this year between January and March, our sales are actually down 34 percent. And what we've seen since about 2008 is that our sales are, are slowly, um, slowly dropping. Um, Can I interrupt you with a quick sure. question? You said $320 million in exports. Is that for the entire period or is that annually? That, that, that's an, on average annually, annually. yes, right. for the last 10 years. Okay. Um, so, you know, we, we have seen our, our market go up and down, basically. Um, in 2009, we sold about $170 million um, worth, of, worth of agricultural goods into Cuba. In 2010, it was $117 million. So or uh, yes, 100 and, $170 million. And so what we are trying to do is, again, to create that relationship where Cuba looks to the United States in order to purchase their commodities before they turn to our, our competitors. And because of that, um, you know, for the last 10 years, we have not seen very much movement except for further restrictions when it comes to our exports to Cuba. Um, and what we have seen now is that there is potentially an action that can be taken. Um, Chairman Colin Peterson of the House Agriculture Committee and Representative Jerry Moran have introduced H.R. 4645, the Travel Reform and Export Enhancement Act. And Farm Bureau has kind of rallied ar around that bill with a lot of others within the agricultural industry as well as those within the business community and, and the NGO community. Um, we have gotten a very serious signal from Chairman Peterson that he wants to mark up this bill. He wants to take this bill to the House floor. Um, so we are cu currently working to make sure that we have the necessary votes in order to make this happen. Um, some of the provisions that are within this bill um, are a little controversial, and obviously we have hurt this as we've been kind of working on this bill. Um, but we do think that this bill is overall good for U.S. agriculture and a good step. Um, again, this is not a complete lifting of the embargo, but it is a step um, in easing some of the restrictions that we have in place. Um, I'm going to go through those provisions and kind of give you the agricultural reasons um, and some of the, the issues that we've had with what this bill is trying to affect. Um, the first issue that is covered under the bill is the returning, of, returning payment of cash in advance to the commercial terms as it was a, intended by Congress. Um, back in 2005, OFAC, the Office of Foreign Asset Control, um, negated the original intent of Congress and created, created a special definition as of what cash payment in advance is that only applies to Cuba, um, which in the long term increased the cost of, for Cuba in purchasing U.S. products. And basically that is at the point where we began to see ourselves fluctuate instead of continue on that growth trend we had for the first five years. 
what basically OFAC did was prior to 2005, payment of cash in advance meant that U.S. agriculture would sign a contract with Cuba in order to provide a certain commodity. We would ship that, we would ship that product from the U.S. port into the international port within Cuba. Cuba would inspect that product, make sure it met the terms of the contract, would then pay for cash, using cash, would then send the cash to a third country bank. That third country bank would then send it to the United States, at which point we would turn over bill of lading and basically ownership to the Cubans. What happened in 2005 with the OFAC change was OFAC came in and said, nope, that's not how we define cash payment in advance. How we define cash payment in advance is that cash has to be received for that product before it leaves U.S. ports. That poses a serious problem. Basically, in doing any type of commercial business, whether it's with Cuba or any other country, once payment is received, ownership of that product is turned over to the purchaser. Well, if Cuba is paying us before that product leaves U.S. ports, that means Cuba property is here in the United States. And I'm not saying this government is willing to seize food product that is heading to Cuba, but obviously there was, obviously it did set up a potential threat. It obviously did set up a situation in that it made Cuba very nervous because of the potential seizure of, of its product, of its assets, the commodity here in the United States. So again, because of this, we had to look to a new, a new way in order for Cuba to pay us. Prior to, prior to 2005, cash was the, the main instrument that was being used. Um, after 2005, the Trade Sanctions Reform Act gave the option for Cuba to be able to pay us either in cash or letters of credit. And so we moved to letters of credit, Cuba moved to letters of credit in order to purchase product from the United States. Moving to that letter of credit increased the cost of our product even more um, than using just the cash method. And that was because of the third country bank. Obviously, no bank is going to be willing to do a transaction for free, whether they're using um, cash or whether they're using letters of credit. And because of the credit guarantee under a letter of credit, um, there's going to be even a higher cost to Cuba um, in order for the bank, third country bank, in order to back that. Um, so. Currently, we've been using letters of credit. We want to revert back to the traditional means of cash payment in advance, meaning that it can go ahead and be in the international port uh, when Cuba pays for the product. There's been a lot of arguments as to, well, why OFAC did that. And the main thing has been, well, we're, that the change was made in order to protect um, the U.S. seller. Um, but the current definition does nothing to protect the U.S. exporter. Um, we kind of feel that it was basically put in place in an attempt to hinder our, our U.S. exports. Um, we had an administration at the time that was not very fond of Cuba and was not very fond of the, the opening that we did have in regards to, to trade. And so I think they kind of saw this as a way to, to slow down that trade um, because prior to 2005, exporters did not have a problem receiving payment from cash. Um, all the exports that, exporters that we have spoken to, the exporters that have been involved in studies through ITC and others have all claimed that there was never a, there was never a problem in receiving cash payment um, from, from Cuba. The other issue that is in the bill deals with elimination of the requirement for Cuba to wire payment for U.S. goods through a third country bank. Um, again, this is a provision that only increases the cost of our U.S. commodity. Um, because we have to go through a third country bank. What we would prefer is for Cuba to be able to wire cash for that product directly into U.S. banks. Um, there's been, again, a lot of confusion about this issue in that, well, we, Cuba does not have good credit and we should not be offering credit to Cuba. Make no mistake, this does not offer credit to Cuba. We are still requiring Cuba to pay for U.S. products in cash. Um, this does not open up any credit, whether it's government credit, U.S. government credit, or, or commercial credit. Um, so the issue of credit basically does not apply. The argument of against credit does not apply in this situation. The, la the last provision that's in there, which is the issue that probably causes the most concern, um, that definitely causes the most heartburn when we go in to talk to members of Congress about this, is the travel restrictions. Um, and lifting the travel restrictions. And the question that we constantly get, it, get is why is agriculture pushing this? Lifting the travel restrictions is not an agriculture-related provision. 
Um, but we believe that the travel provision is ag-related um, and because it will have a positive effect on our sales into the country. Um, allowing Americans to travel into Cuba will increase food consumption in the country. Um, and this just isn't something that the ag community has stated or done reports on. This is something that even our own government, the USITC International Trade Commission, has a report out there that says, yes, lifting the travel restrictions will have an increase on food demand within the country. Um, it will not only increase the food demand and food consumption within the country, but it will also change the types of products um, that we have normally been sending. Um, typically what we send are bulk commodities. Um, these are lower valued products. Uh, these are the types of products that are not highly processed, uh, that, are not hi that are not packaged typically, uh, but allowing Americans to travel in and increasing the travel industry within Cuba will provide a demand for those higher valued, higher, higher processed um, higher processed foods. The issue has also come up in regards to American spending cash taking U.S. dollars into Cuba and what that effect will be in that we're basically giving dollars to the, U to the, Cuban, to the Cuban government. Um, yes, U.S. dollars will be taken into Cuba. Um, there, there is no denying that fact. But at the same point, American agriculture is not asking for credit. Um, we understand the risk that's there. We are still requiring Cuba to pay in U.S. dollars. And so, therefore, we, under, we know, um, and most people know, that Cuba is a dollar deficit country. So in order for them to be able to purchase U.S. commodities, they need to have those dollars. And so we think that, yes, while U American citizens will be taking U.S. dollars into the market, some of those dollars will be returned back to the United States in the purchase of U.S. foods. Um, and then the last reason outside of the economics is, you know, basically Cuba is the only U.S. sanctioned country out there that we are not allowed to travel to. Um, you can travel to Iran, you can travel to the Sudan, you can travel to Syria, um, but Cuba is the only country that you are not allowed, um, or we as citizens are not allowed to travel to. Um, so it doesn't really make much sense, um, and, you know, it kind of goes at the rights of, of U.S. citizens. Um, couple of other special cases when it comes to Cuba and other sanctioned countries. Not only um, is Cuba the only country sanctioned country that we are not allowed to travel to, but in, in credit in of itself, um, while we're not asking for credit again for Cuba, I just want to make sure that that's clear, uh, it's still interesting to note that while we prohibit U.S. credit programs from being used for sales with other sanctioned countries, um, there is a presidential waiver. So if the U.S. government or commercially decided that we wanted to provide credit to the Sudan in order to buy U.S. commodities, um, the president could waive um, the restriction in place. That waiver does not apply to Cuba. Um, the pre there is no way for the president to change um, the, the, the credit issue or being allowed to offer credit. Um, when it comes to Cuba. Yes, he could change the regulations, um, but this is, this is different from changing the regulations and of themselves. Um, and then the, the, other, the other issue is that we can sell agricultural products to any other sanctioned country um, in, under the traditional commercial terms that we sell to any other country. Cuba, again, is the only country where there are special rules that have been established in order for us to to carry forward our transactions. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, again, you know, U.S. agriculture is not requesting that the embargo be lifted, but again, just looking to be able to take small steps in order to lift those key restrictions that will increase our competitiveness in the market. Um, Cuba is a market. It is not a large market. Um, I'm, you know, Cuba, I think o ITC estimates that Cuba's imports were roughly about $1.8 billion. Um, it is nothing in comparison to what we export to Mexico or Canada or some other Central and South American countries. But nonetheless, it is a market that U.S. agriculture has not been able to see its full potential in because of the restrictions that, that we have in place. Um, so I will go ahead and end my comments there. And um, I appreciate your time and listening, and I look forward to your questions. Great. Thanks very much, Chris. Steve. Yeah. I, I'm Steve Richard with the National Tour Association. We have um, about 700 tour operators who put together uh, packages all over the world. 
uh, to send people on trips. And uh, you know, we come at this uh, very basically with uh, simply people should have the right to travel. But I want to uh, first uh, tell you that I happen to have a house that I inherited that I rent out in Florida. And the reason I want to share this with you is that both my uh, real estate broker who handles the house and the tenants are Cuban Americans. So we discussed this issue a little bit uh, in February and I'm uh, excited to tell you that there was no agreement at all. The broker who is younger is all for everybody traveling to Cuba and the tenants who are older are funding the people who are uh, lobbying Congress to make sure that that doesn't happen. And uh, the one thing that I can do to tie back to the question earlier is that uh, these tenants have been in the house more than half of the time since I've had it for 25 years and the only time the house got damaged was when I rented it to drunken college students. <laughs> We're not um, going to get away from that, are we? <laughs> had, to had to tie that in. <laughs> had to tie that in. Um, you know, it, it's really a very uh, interesting, you know, uh, sitting next to Chris, we've been working together uh, through uh, his folks and our folks, uh, you know, lobbying this piece of legislation on the uh, ag and travel bill put together. And it's really uh, wonderful that you were mentioning all the key travel points, so I don't have to spend too much time <laughs> on it. But, you know, quite frankly, this whole issue of freedom to travel is all about the United States, and the business that will come out of the travel to Cuba is all about the United States. And, you know, I was going to mention uh, Libya, North Korea, and Iran, which are other places that we can travel. And, you know, when we're out there telling everybody to uh, copy uh, democracy and the freedom that we have here in the United States, it really becomes a little difficult to tell people they should practice freedom when we're not practicing it ourselves because we uh, forbid people to travel to only one country. And yes, there are some places where they refuse us the right to enter. But in this case, we're forbidding some of our own citizens the right to travel to only one place. So in order to get the word out that democracy and freedom works, we need to put our own house in order. And that's where the travel uh, industry is coming from. You know, when you look at uh, the content of uh, H.R. 4645, which is the Combined Agricultural Freedom of Travel to Cuba uh, legislation, there's some other little aspects to it as well. Um, I spent some time working on talking to the New Hampshire delegation on the Freedom of Travel to Cuba Day uh, many months ago, and we had with us uh, <coughs> somebody who was in the medical equipment sales portion of the allowed products that can go to Cuba. And he was very much in favor of the Travel to Cuba bill, not because it would simply create more sales, but because he couldn't service the products he wanted to sell that were medical supplies because he didn't have the right to travel to service the products. So you can't sell a sophisticated piece of medical equipment to the Cubans, even though they need it, unless you can follow up by having the staff necessary with the trained uh, skills in order to keep that piece of equipment running. So there's a lot more to this travel element than just the leisure portion or the food that might be consumed by travelers. We have to be able to service those things that we allow uh, to be sold. A lot of debate about this. Uh, just uh, yesterday, I happened to notice that Peter Greenberg, who is one of the uh, really big uh, commentators on travel, and I know that he gets uh, some airtime as well as what he writes, uh, noted that there are many people who are flouting the restrictions. And in his comments uh, that you can find on uh, Twitter, he said that, you know, yes, there are OFEC uh, regulations in place, but if you tell uh, people as you come back through customs that you've been to Cuba, they basically don't act on it. So we have uh, a situation where, quite frankly, it's better to make sure you tell people you've gone to Cuba as opposed to trying to make uh, an effort to uh, suggest <coughs> that you haven't, because you get, probably get in more trouble by uh, telling our Homeland Security folks that you didn't go when you did than if you did go and say, yep, uh, that's what happened, because at this point there really have not been uh, any steps taken to uh, go after folks that uh, have been there. And he even mentioned that there are a number of people who are trying to get this to go to court. And uh, they're going 
to Cuba, stating they've gone. They want to test it in court and see whether uh, their rights have been uh, denied under the Constitution. And they have uh, T-shirts that say, <coughs> Venceremos, which simply translated is, we shall overcome. So they're trying to you know, exercise this right, and they're doing it by uh, visiting Cuba without the official uh, licenses to do so. You've heard earlier uh, on the previous panel that the demand could be up to a million uh, visitors annually. And I want to put a uh, parenthetical in there. That doesn't include what might also be the case coming on cruise ships. And it is correct that there's not enough uh, docking facilities to handle the kinds of cruise ships that could come. But if you look at what's been happening uh, very recently, a lot of the cruise lines are actually going in and building those facilities if there's the demand. So should that change? Uh, we could expect to see some things happen very quickly because it's very clear that there's a lot of demand uh, to see Cuba. Having been on this uh, issue only two years now, I constantly run into people when they hear that I'm involved with this issue. The first thing is, I want to go. When can I go? Can I go on one of those missions if you ever get to go? Uh, people really want to go and see what's going on in Cuba. And there have been, in just the past year, seven more new licenses for tour operators and a 20% increase of people who are going to Cuba just from the relative market. So since President Obama changed the rules so that third cousins, aunts, uncles, sisters, brothers, et cetera, can go, uh, it's already uh, growing. And it makes for a very interesting uh, situation. I was in Florida and had this uh, opportunity uh, just last week uh, to visit with some uh, folks. And I had dinner in Little Havana on Cali Ocho. And I really get the politics because it's not too hard when you see a two-foot story high sign about, you know, free Cuba now on a car dealership that people really care uh, phenomenally about it. I also was in the Miami-Dade courthouse uh, to check on the property taxes on that house I was telling you about. And there's a whole display there on, you know, famous Cuban Americans throughout the United States, which again uh, emphasized you know, how important this is to the community. And they also had a map. And the map showed how many Cuban Americans live in every state. And number one was Florida, 540,000. Number two was New Jersey, 77,000. And then states in close proximity were Texas and California have much bigger populations upon which to draw to have 70, 60,000 uh, Cuban Americans. So. It makes sense, particularly in South Florida, that the politics plays such a big role with that kind of population. I'm from New Jersey, born there. Uh, don't know how 77,000 Cuban Americans can really sway the politics of an entire state when there's 7 million, almost 8 million people living in New Jersey, although I can tell you that New Jersey does have a political issue that makes it kind of tough. There was a state trooper that was killed by a woman named Joanne Chesimard who has um, been given asylum in Cuba. And when you talk with some of the New Jersey members of Congress, they said, until that gets straightened out, we can't vote for anything relating to Cuba because of that asylum issue. So our tour operators and those of the United States Tour Operator Association, which is uh, a sister association, what was said, but what was underscored in terms of the interest section in the Swiss Embassy here in Washington, and at least three other sub-cabinet ministers, uh, foreign affairs, uh, foreign investment, transportation, <coughs> and every single operating company in Cuba, which are all subsidiaries in some way of the government, the president or vice president of those companies, ones like uh, Cubana Khan and uh, Havana Tour who handle uh, the inbound uh, receptive work, the hotels, the tours, the fishing excursions. They were all there talking to the tour operators and their portion of the program was more uh, of a destination marketing presentation of 
here's the hotels we have, here's the fishing we have, here's the ground transportation we have, it was all about what's already in place, whereas uh, from the U.S. side it was more a discussion of, you know, what has to happen in terms of being able to move uh, people in and out of Cuba. And looking at it through a United States prism on the travel side, there's going to be a lot of people that can get put to work if Cuba opens up. Airlines, cruise lines, tour operators, travel agents who sell the tour operator product, advertising agencies. We even had somebody that is on the NTA board who happened to be there, and before we left the meeting, she was already trying to pitch U.S.-based services for uh, public relations to uh, Minister Cruz, you know, Mr. Minister uh, Moreiro Cruz about, hey, we could help you if this opens up to get the word out about what to do. So um, that was really interesting to me, and there was an entire section, and I mean a very significant, including all the documentation about what one has to do about uh, direct investments in Cuba if you wanted to run a tour company, if you wanted to be in a, the hotel business, if you wanted to um, help expand uh, the cruise capacity, you know, all of which was through partnerships. Uh, but they made it uh, very clear that you know, uh, outside uh, countries could have uh, private sector investment of up to 50 percent and how it operates and you know, what uh, the profit uh, margins would be, and they spent a tremendous amount of time and gave out material uh, that showed uh, what could happen. And I'm also an observer of uh, things that happen outside of uh, the political discussions, and it sent a message that this level of delegation would show up and say that they were interested. Uh, it's real easy to send you know, just a few people way down in the bureaucracy, but to send the minister not only for tourism, but for, you know, uh, four other uh, cabinet-level agencies and then all the heads of all of the operating companies said something to me that they were very seriously interested. I'm also a Katrina survivor, and my official home is in Gulfport, Mississippi. And you can imagine how closely I'm following the oil spill, which is not too far from the beaches that we just cleaned up from the hurricane and just now are beginning to put uh, the houses back in place. And I want to tell you that you know, I worked through two years in my previous job on you know, volunteers and relief and a lot of other things to try to put um, our community back together. And I noticed that we did get an offer of medical help from Cuba, which the United States government turned down. And I'm pleased that right now U.S. medical teams are working with Cuban medical teams in Haiti. I think that's real interesting. But I think we have a new challenge, and you just heard about it in the previous panel too, which is the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And you didn't hear the whole comment, but there is part of it uh, that's out there, which is can the Gulf of Mexico Gulf Stream move the oil you know, around Florida up the East Coast, which, by the way, also puts some of the most important beach attractions, like a Barradaro uh, in Cuba, at risk. And that's another reason that it really would be helpful if we have these dialogues open and a lot more uh, cooperation. So we're watching that. I had a really interesting uh, situation that occurred uh, last week. I get a call at the end of the day on Wednesday. I was asked if I wanted to have uh, breakfast with uh, a member of Congress. So I said, is it a fundraiser? Because uh, we're not particularly in uh, a place where we do a lot of uh, contributions. No, nope, it's uh, a breakfast with the congressman. So I said, okay. And I figured it was some group. So I show up. I was a little bit late uh, because I didn't know what room it was in the building uh, I was attending. And I'm asking where this breakfast is for the congressman. They don't know. Woman comes upstairs. Are you Steve Richard? Yes. 
oh, we didn't know where you were. I said, I'm sorry, I, I was a tiny bit late and I didn't know what room this breakfast is in. So it was downstairs, go downstairs. It's the congressman and his chief of staff, that's who she was. And when it all got boiled out, he's from an area that has a lot of rice production. He's already cool on that part of the bill. He's been traditionally against any way, shape, or form helping the regime. And he wanted me to explain what was good about it for U.S. business, for him to consider the whole bill when it comes to the floor. So things are moving even on the legislation. And I just want to close with one uh, final note and look forward to the questions. Because of who we are uh, at the National Tour Association and, and how uh, we work, uh, we move people from within and to North America all over the world. And we have a board member, uh, first time ever from South America who was elected primarily by people from the U.S. and some from Canada. Um, who you know, comes from Buenos Aires, Argentina. And one thing that I consistently hear from our friends in the rest of the Western Hemisphere, including our Canadian members, including our Mexican members, members from the Dominican Republic, uh, <coughs> members from other parts of Central and South America, is why are we maintaining this foreign policy position? It's not helping when you know votes come up like they do in the UN, every single nation in the Western Hemisphere, except us, votes against our policy in Cuba. So as someone who sees uh, travel as a way to open the door for better relations and knows that we can go to all these other uh, places where the regimes are certainly not any better and in many cases prospectively worse, uh, we think you know, travel is the way to go to get this thing moving and the human uh, contact and discussion between our citizens, even the ones on cruises in shorts, and the Cuban people, I think would be a very positive development uh, in order uh, for us to have better relations and you know, hopefully accomplish some of the goals that have not been implemented or changed in the last 50 years. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Joel, in español. Yeah. Okay. Bueno, muchas gracias al Wilson Center por la invitación y realmente es un placer estar aquí con los panelistas y haber escuchado un tema tan interesante como son las posibles inversiones bueno, el, o el desarrollo de las inversiones norteamericanas presentes y, y quizás futuras en, en Cuba. Eh, realmente eh, por muchos años eh, yo trabajé dentro del gobierno de Cuba, eh, era el asesor económico y laboral del secretario general de la Central de Trabajadores de Cuba, el único sindicato oficial que tiene afiliado a aproximadamente 4 millones de trabajadores. Realmente eh, venir acá a transmitir la experiencia que obtuve estando dentro del gobierno cubano y posteriormente en los 10 años que llevo fuera eh, contribuyendo oh, con el desarrollo del movimiento sindical independiente dentro de Cuba, eh, creo que sería un pequeño aporte por nuestra parte a quizás entender un poco más el tema de la inversión extranjera en Cuba. Realmente eh, Cuba en la actualidad es el segundo país de América Latina que más convenios internacionales uh, tiene firmados ante la Organización Internacional del Trabajo. Son 89 convenios lo que tiene firmado. Realmente las inversiones extranjeras en Cuba, las actuales, violan la gran mayoría de esos convenios. Violan el convenio 87 sobre el tema de la libertad sindical, violan el convenio 98 sobre la negociación colectiva, se viola el convenio 95 sobre la política salarial, se viola el convenio 122 sobre política de empleo. El trabajador cubano jamás en la vida es un trabajador de una empresa mixta o de un joint venture o de una, co una, una producción cooperada o de un acuerdo de administración, o quizás mañana si se autoriza y se levanta la prohibición de que viajen los estadounidenses a Cuba, jamás en la vida podría ser trabajador de alguna empresa vinculada al sector turístico eh, norteamericano. Sería simple y llanamente un trabajador de una agencia empleadora cubana, el cual no tiene derecho a una negociación colectiva, el cual no tiene derecho a un salario justo, el cual está pendiente que sobre su cabeza exista todo un proceso de verificación política para poder obtener una plaza en 
un determinado sector. En el sector turístico, digamos, a Manuel Marrero se refería hace unos días a que Cuba en los últimos 20 años ha recibido 29 millones de turistas de 70 países. Uh, en 20 años no ha cambiado nada en Cuba. Yo no creo que el turismo norteamericano vaya a cambiar nada en Cuba, se lo digo sinceramente. Eh, por otra parte, el año pasado Cuba recibió 2.425.000 turistas, de ellos 906.000 turistas fueron canadienses, es decir, el 37,7% de todos los turistas que se recibieron el pasado año en Cuba fueron canadienses. Realmente eh, pensaríamos, bueno, Canadá, que es una democracia consolidada, uh, podría quizás llevar algunos de esos principios de democracia a Cuba, compartirlo con los trabajadores cubanos, compartirlo con el pueblo cubano. No hemos visto ningún tipo de avance, no hemos visto de que ningún turista canadiense haya estado muy interesado en el tema de derechos humanos en Cuba, ni haya estado interesado en nada de esto. Eh, también el pasado año viajaron a Cuba eh, 300.000 cubanos americanos, es el 13,3% del total de los turistas que viajaron a la isla. Eh, realmente eh, los cubanos cuando viajan a la isla están llevando uh, a sus familiares una cosa muy humanitaria y muy lógica. Hay medidas que han tomado el gobierno norteamericano que yo nunca he compartido, como fue la limitación del envío de remesas o, o cosas así que realmente fueron medidas realmente muy desafortunadas para, para el pueblo cubano. Realmente cuando los cubanos americanos viajan a, a la isla, lo que tienen ahí van muchas necesidades básicas que tiene la población cubana y que tienen los trabajadores cubanos, yo creo que eso es una cosa muy humanitaria y que todos debemos entender. Eh, por otra parte, existe un sector muy importante que es el sector agrícola. Quizás después me podría volver a referir al sector turístico si hay algún interés referente al tema. En el sector turístico Cuba tiene aproximadamente unas 38 mil habitaciones de, en 240 hoteles dedicados al turismo. Eh, realmente eh, el turismo en Cuba, a, según cifras oficiales y según diferentes escenarios económicos en los que pude participar cuando formaba parte del gobierno cubano, el gobierno cubano apuesta muy fuertemente al, al sector turístico y apuesta muy fuertemente al levantamiento de eh, la limitación de que el ciudadano norteamericano viaje a la isla. Ellos están calculando que en el primer año, si se levanta el embargo uh, de visitas de norteamericanos a la isla, pudieran llegar a Cuba aproximadamente entre 5 y 7 millones de ciudadanos norteamericanos, que eso aportaría aproximadamente unos 7 mil a 9 mil millones de dólares a la economía cubana. La economía cubana eh, no es eh, ineficiente debido al embargo, aquí se estaba comentando el embargo, digamos, en el sector turístico, en el año 2008, Cuba ingresó tuvo ingresos brutos por 2.740 millones de dólares. Para personas como yo que trabajé en el sector económico dentro de Cuba, sabemos que para producir un dólar de ingreso en el sector turístico hay que gastar 76 centavos de dólar. Eso implica que de los 1.740 millones de dólares brutos, Cuba ingresó netamente 682 millones de dólares solamente. Es decir, eh, echarle la culpa totalmente a que el embargo norteamericano es el culpable de toda la, la crisis que tiene el, el pueblo cubano y de toda la desgracia que tiene la economía cubana, yo creo que es, 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 es un poco inmaduro y quizás un poco ingenuo echarle toda la culpa al, al embargo norteamericano en ese sentido. Por otra parte, el hecho de que la población cubana no tenga arroz, no tenga frijoles, no tenga carne, tenga que comprar el pollo en los Estados Unidos, eso se debe a las propias deformaciones estructurales de la economía cubana, se debe a la incapacidad que ha tenido el gobierno cubano durante más de 50 años de ser una economía eficiente. Se han pasado en la agricultura por todo tipo de cambios estructurales, unidades básicas de producción cooperativa, <coughs> cooperativas de producción agropecuaria, fincas estatales, eh, y nada, nada ha logrado que los cubanos produzcan alimentos. Han tenido generales, coroneles, eh, visalmirantes, han tenido a todo el mundo dirigiendo la agricultura cubana y la agricultura cubana sigue siendo un caos. ¿Sigue siendo un caos por qué? Por culpa de los norteamericanos, por culpa de, del embargo, por culpa de que los ciudadanos norteamericanos no puedan viajar a la isla. No lo creo. Sigue siendo un problema por el exceso de centralización de la economía cubana. Mañana podremos liberar el levantamiento del embargo, se podrán viajar los ciudadanos norteamericanos a la isla y si sigue ese... Ese régimen eh, dirigido por, o, por los hermanos Castro o por algunos de, de la descendencia de esta plebe, eh, seguiremos viendo que lo que el sistema de empleo cubano va a generar es más policías. No va a generar más, más eficiencia, no va a generar 
eh, realmente sistemas productivos de eficiencia a lo que estás aspirando. Cuba cuando va a la inversión extranjera siempre, desde que se emitió la ley 77 sobre la inversión extranjera en el año 1995, ha estado detrás de tres cosas. Capital, mercado y tecnología. Son las tres cosas que le importa al gobierno cubano. Inclusive en la ley de inversiones se habla de, de empresas totalmente privadas. Todavía no hay una sola empresa totalmente privada en Cuba, ni la habrá. A Cuba no le interesa realmente tener ninguna empresa privada. A Cuba le interesa tener el 51% de las acciones. Le interesa que cuando el inversionista llegue a Cuba, abra una cuenta en el Banco Financiero Internacional para poder hacer después el corralito financiero este que hicieron, que no le pagan a la gente, no le dejan a, la, a los empresarios repatriar las utilidades que tienen en la cuenta del Banco Financiero Internacional por razones obvias. Cuba en la actualidad está en bancarrota, Cuba no le paga a nadie. Y Cuba no le va a pagar a nadie en los próximos 20 años si sigue este proceso de centralización excesiva de la economía. Ojalá no duremos 20 años más con el mismo régimen. Realmente, por otra parte, alguien se refería en una de las preguntas en el panel anterior a las posibles demandas que, que existen en Cuba contra inversionistas extranjeros. Sí, han existido demandas, han existido demandas. En el año 1999, el Comité Cubano Pro Derechos Humanos, que dirige Ricardo Bofil y la Federación Sindical de Plantas Eléctricas, presentaron a la Corte de Miami una demanda contra 42 empresas que tienen inversiones extranjeras en Cuba. Un año después, eh, el caso fue sobrecedido debido a que la Corte de Miami, la Corte, el, el juez de la Corte no tenía jurisdicción sobre 42 empresas de 18 países contra los cuales se puso la demanda. En octubre del año 2006, eh, tres trabajadores cubanos que lograron obtener asilo político en los Estados Unidos, que laboraban en el astillero de Curazao, eh, ponen una demanda, interponen una demanda por uso de trabajo esclavo en una corte norteamericana, en una corte federal del condado Miami-Dade. Eh, dos años después, en octubre de 2008, el juez King dicta sentencia y dice que los trabajadores sí fueron abusados y fueron usados como esclavos en el caso de Curazao y le impone al astillero de Curazao una indemnización para estos trabajadores de 80 millones de dólares. En la actualidad el monto anda por unos 120 millones de dólares y está en el proceso de eh, colectar el dinero por concepto de, esta, de este fallo judicial. Hay un tercer eh, registrado, hay un tercer caso de demanda que fue en febrero del 2010, donde ocho médicos y enfermeras cubanas uh, demandan en una corte federal también a, al gobierno de Cuba, de Venezuela y específicamente a la empresa Citco venezolana por un monto de 450 millones aproximadamente por también eh, uso de trabajo esclavo. En este caso, bueno, no sé, no, no, no sé porque eh, no he tenido conocimiento, no, no ha sido un caso que ha estado vinculado al grupo nuestro. Al grupo nuestro se estuvo muy vinculado con el caso de Curazao y bueno, si le hemos dado seguimiento de que eh, los trabajadores cubanos eh, lograron protección en Colombia hasta que logramos traerlo a los Estados Unidos. Y, y realmente no sé en el caso de los médicos cómo procederán en, en las próximas semanas, pero bueno, quizás si no logra un concepto, si no se logra el, el, un, un, un fallo judicial por concepto de que eh, realmente fueron usados como esclavos, realmente en, alguna, en algún momento realmente tiene un impacto desde el punto de vista de las relaciones de que se conozca a nivel internacional que está sucediendo con los médicos cubanos en el exterior. Por otra parte, eh, yo creo que sí, que, lo, que es muy importante para Cuba y para una Cuba en transición un proceso de inversión. Pero un proceso de inversión de cualquier parte del mundo, ya sea norteamericano, de la Unión Europea, de quien sea, pero un proceso de inversión que esté eh, basado en los derechos fundamentales que tienen los trabajadores en cualquier parte del mundo. Que un trabajador cubano tenga derecho a la libertad de asociación, que un trabajador cubano tenga derecho a la negociación colectiva, que un trabajador cubano tenga derecho a la libre expresión, tenga acceso libre al Internet, porque estamos hablando de que los ciudadanos norteamericanos vayan a la isla, pero yo no sé si los ciudadanos norteamericanos conocen que el ciudadano promedio en Cuba no tiene acceso a internet, no tiene acceso ni a un celular. Y realmente es lamentable todo este tipo de cosas. Que cuando las inversiones extranjeras vayan en Cuba, no hagan lo que hágase la Cherry de Canadá, de contaminar el medio ambiente en sus, en sus inversiones que tienen en Moa Níquel, en la extracción de níquel y el cobalto, donde las márgenes del río Moa son un desastre por el sulfuro de níquel donde cuando hayan inversiones eh, de la Repsol en el caso de las zonas que Cuba tiene contratada, ojalá no haya ningún accidente 
Eh, como decía Piñón, ojalá el, el accidente nunca suceda, porque si sucede un accidente en las costas de Cuba sería desastroso para todos los Estados Unidos y sería desastroso para toda la costa norte y donde quiera que ellos tienen el, el, el esquema de las posibles extracciones esta de, de búsqueda de petróleo en, en el Golfo de México. Eh, realmente eh, yo no estoy en contra de las inversiones, yo creo que cualquier país para que prospere y debe tener inversiones, pero debe tener inversiones basadas en, en principios básicos, en principios universales, en el respeto a los derechos humanos, en, en tener leyes anticorrupción. Realmente en Cuba es un mal endémico del sistema la corrupción. Y todos los inversionistas extranjeros, de una forma u otra, tienen que entrar por el carril del gobierno y tienen que depender en alguna manera del chantaje del gobierno para poder invertir en Cuba. No hay un solo inversionista extranjero en Cuba que no se haya, no se haya dejado chantajear por el gobierno. Recientemente, y lamentablemente, eh, Solmeliá, eh, cuando cumplía 20 años de sus inversiones en Cuba, eh, hicieron declaraciones muy desafortunadas en Cuba, diciendo que agradecían al gobierno eh, toda esta amistad y que serían... Eh, muy buenos socios comerciales en el futuro. Eh, con la Melea nosotros hemos tenido y hemos intentado eh, expresarle de forma reiterada las violaciones que en sus inversiones se cometen en Cuba. Ellos no han hecho caso, eh, la Sherry de Canadá tampoco ha hecho caso. Realmente son empresas que en algún momento determinado tendrán que recibir en una futura Cuba de democrática eh, las demandas civiles que sean necesarias porque realmente... Eh, no solamente por parte nuestra, por parte de organizaciones sindicales independientes dentro de Cuba, eh, por parte de diferentes grupos opositores en Cuba, han manifestado que en una futura Cuba democrática, todos los inversionistas que han sido cómplices del, del sistema cubano de explotación del obrero cubano, recibirán de alguna manera algún tipo de demanda en cortes cubanas o en cortes de tercero país. Y nosotros hemos tratado de llevar... Uh, también demandas en Italia en contra de Telecom por por, acciones de, por por las relaciones que ha tenido Telecom de complicidad con Etexa en grabar uh, a los opositores las llamadas y de los cuales después estos opositores han sido sancionados en cortes cubanas. Eh, no hemos tenido el éxito necesario, seguimos trabajando en, en función de que cada empresa eh, que cometa violaciones de derechos laborales y sindicales en Cuba, de alguna manera, en algún momento, eh, vamos a tener la oportunidad eh, nosotros y los trabajadores cubanos de, de establecer algún tipo de demanda en contra de ellos. Reitero, no estoy en contra de las inversiones, ojalá mañana Cuba pudiera recibir 20 mil millones de dólares en inversiones, bastante falta le hace, pero yo creo que mientras que no cambie el sistema político en Cuba, realizar inversiones con un ladrón es bastante riesgoso para cualquiera. Muchas gracias. Okay, please. Well, thank you, uh, Cindy, for inviting me. Uh, as I was introduced earlier, I have the great pleasure of being on the Board of Trustees of the Woodrow Wilson Center, but the opinions that I'm going to give today are my opinions and not those necessarily of the Center. But I do think it's a, it's a great forum. Uh, as I listen to a lot of the commentators beforehand, I, uh, I realize we could have a program like this on any one of the subjects that was touched on and uh, hopefully we will continue to, to do so. So congratulations on putting it together and look forward to, to many more. My job is to kind of um, address these issues from the lawyer's perspective. I have worked on these issues for many years and uh, 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 have worked with Congress on the Helms-Burton legislation and uh, some other um, cases and matters uh, and what I'm going to try to do is dispense with what I had as prepared remarks and kind of address many of the items that were brought up today in the context of the, uh, of the legal points. But what I'd like to do first, though, is to give you a little bit of background because we all talk about the Cuba issue uh, and we talk about it as if it started last week and everybody forgets the history. So I'm, I'm going to give you a, a, a little bit of that. Um, and what I'm going to do in, in my remarks in, in addressing all these points is to focus, uh, because I worked on the Helms-Burton Law, as my seminal point, I'm going to address the property issue, because you'll see it's going to cut across everything everybody said before. And then I'm also going to touch on, because of, the, uh, of our speaker, uh, the speaker who preceded me, a little bit on the labor issue. On, just from, from a, a perspective on, on the policy, uh, obviously, uh, the United States and Cuba had an extremely close uh, commercial relationship until uh, the Castros uh, came to power. And we first suspended uh, uh, some of our commercial activities with Cuba in July of 19, er, in 1960 following 
the confiscation of U.S. property. And the first thing we did is we didn't impose a full embargo. We said, you can't just take our property. We're, we're going to uh, sanction you. We're not going to have any kind of financial um, uh, transactions with you. We could still export, but now all of a sudden we were cutting back on, on, the, on the financing and on the uh, investments uh, in Cuba. With time, Congress got very upset about the confiscations, and in the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961, they basically told President Kennedy to impose a full embargo on Cuba. They put a provision in the bill um, uh, that said, on the basis of many things, but one of them being the, the confiscations, the president is empowered to impose a full and complete embargo on Cuba. A lot of people have said, you know, well, this is really a presidential issue. It is and it isn't, because the Congress was the first one to step out and say, you should do it. And uh, uh, not in 1961, but in 1962, uh, President Kennedy finally uh, proclaimed a full and complete embargo um, on, on business with Cuba. Now, for all practical purposes, although that was a unilateral embargo, I would suggest to you that the embargo really didn't start until 1992. And the reason that I say that is because I always hear the, the argument, oh, we've had the same policy for 51 years. After 51 years, it doesn't work. Why are we still doing it? Well, the fact is that that's not been the case. Until 1992, the Soviet Union was the huge benefactor of Cuba. Uh, Mr. Pignon gave you the background, how much the, uh, the subsidies were. General estimates were about $6 billion a year in subsidies to, to, to Cuba. For such a small country, I would suggest to you that um, – and, and given Cuba's economic condition uh, early on, that uh, really the streets of Havana should be paved in gold with that m amount of money that was coming in from the, from the Soviet Union. But in 1992, in fact, in October of 1992, Congress passed and uh, President George Herbert Walker Bush signed the Cuban Democracy Act. And the Cuban Democracy Act was the first point at which the embargo actually applied to foreign subsidiaries of U.S. companies. So. Coca-Cola in Atlanta couldn't do business with Cuba, but Coca-Cola in Mexico could until 1992. So we didn't have an embargo. Uh, we had an embargo for the entity sitting in the United States, but their su subsidiaries in the rest of the world could do business with Cuba. So in October of 1992, right a year after they've lost the Soviet subsidies, the, the United States actually tightens the embargo to the point where it actually would have had an opportunity to... to uh, uh, to work. If you look at what happened between 1992 and 2000, you start to see, and that's when they start to call it the special period in, in, in Cuba, you start to see that the regime really started to have to make changes. It started to dollarize the economy, which it later reversed, and it started to sell off assets and to bring foreign investment into the country, which it hadn't ever done before. So an argument can be made that if by the United States actually tightening uh, the embargo, it actually started to have a cause and effect, a positive cause and effect on the uh, Cuban side. But what the Cubans did was that they started to sell the assets that they had confiscated. Uh, as, I, as I heard um, uh, Mr. Pignon comment about the refineries, I remember when Helms Burton was being passed, a uh, member of Congress showing me a brochure that they had acquired in Europe where Cuba was trying to sell off the Texaco refinery. Uh, and they actually, actually, I should have brought it with me, but it, it actually um, highlighted, you know, modern 1957 American technology in the, in the brochure. This is how they started to try to, to, to recover from the loss of the, um, of the Soviet uh, subsidies. They started to put up the sale of, of U.S. assets. Now, why is that significant? Because by the time um, uh, Cuba had finished confiscating American assets in Cuba, they had confiscated assets from 5,911 American claimants. The total value of those assets was $1.8 billion in 1960 dollars. Okay, now you saw the figures with respect to the Cuban economy a little while ago. Um, now imagine how are they going to deal with $1.8 billion in claims in 19. $60. I don't even want to anticipate what it's worth today. And that doesn't count the value of the assets that were confiscated from Cubans, many of which are now American citizens. So as Cuba started to sell off all these assets, Congress reacted 
and said, no, you don't. And by the way, a lot of people think it was the Cuban-American community and the Cuban-American community buying these members of Congress. I was there. The American companies were there every day. They were saying, those are our assets. Protect our assets. And all you had to do was go around Capitol Hill at the time, and you saw the American sugar companies were, were out there. You saw Lone Star Cement was out there, and numerous others who were telling Congress, we still remember, those are still our assets. We expect to get them back one day. So do something. And they did. In fact, if you read Helms Burton carefully, the, Cuba, the, the American certified claimants are actually seen at a higher level and given additional protections from even Cuban Americans who might have a claim against uh, traffickers. So what did Helms Burton do? Helms Burton did really two things in my view. One, it created a road map. Senator Bob Menendez, the senator from New Jersey, a Cuban American senator from New Jersey, wrote the road map for what is required for the United States to lift the embargo, or s better yet, he wrote it in two parts, what is required to suspend the embargo and what is required to actually end the embargo. And uh, among its requirements were things like the legalization of political activity, which we just heard why Senator Menendez, then Congressman Menendez, wrote it into the bill. He also put things in like the release of political prisoners, dissolution of their uh, Menint, which is the ex equivalent of their KGB, uh, public commitment to organizing elections, ceasing interference with radio and TV Marti, and public commitment towards an independent judiciary, respecting, respecting internationally re recognize human rights and allowing independent trade unions, uh, a government that doesn't have Fidel and Raul, and allowing the distribution of assistance to the Cuban people. Now, when you sit with a member of Congress and you go down that list, they don't disagree with a single one of those items. And I would posit that most people don't disagree with any single one of those items, and they don't disagree with them in their totality. So that's one of the things that Helms Burton said. If, if that is accomplished, the United States, all the president has to do is say it was accomplished, the embargo is immediately suspended. Then there are additional things that if it were to happen, the, the embargo is automatically um, uh, uh, ended as, as opposed to suspended. And those are actually moving towards uh, a democracy. Um, uh, and there's re re view additional factors. I won't go through them in, in detail. But, but the key item is it it laid out the, the roadmap. The second part it said was, if you're trafficking in property, you're gonna be subject to having a penalty from the United States. And what does that mean? If I steal your watch and I sell it to Cindy, under Florida law, Pennsylvania law, New York law, Louisiana law, every law in, the United, in any state of the United States, there is a cause of action. You can sue me for civil theft. Forget what the state attorney does to me criminally. But on the civil side, you can sue me for civil theft because I took your property. And you can sue Cindy for trafficking in the uh, stolen property. That's all Helms Burton did. It just did it on an international level. It said that property belongs to our citizens. And if we get you, if we can get jurisdiction over you, you're going to pay the price. We're going we're to allow the person to sue you for trafficking in that confiscated property. We know the state attorney, the Cuban government, is not going to do anything to you but we'll do it to you if we can catch you. Well, uh, we heard uh, today about the telecom industry. At the time that Helms Burton was passed, there was a, a deal being done for uh, the Cuban Telephone Company. The Cuban Telephone Company, by the way, happens to be one of those assets that was confiscated from a U.S. entity. Um, uh, that company, the Cuban Telephone Company, is a wholly owned subsidiary of International Telephone and Telegraph. The Cuban Electric Company, is a wholly owned subsidiary of what was then Boise Cascade. It's actually owned by Office Max. And if any of you know Bob Muse here in town, who's making the rounds all the time, he still represents them. They still know it's their claim. They still say that property belongs to us. The, the, at the time that Helms Burton was being passed, a Mexican conglomerate was gonna go into uh, the Cuban telephone company and get into one of these 50% <coughs> arrangements. They pulled out. They left their junior partner holding the bag. The junior partner is an Italian company at the time known, called STET, now it's uh, Italia Telecom. Uh, the Italian company was doing a joint venture with AT&T, and AT&T said, we're not gonna do business with you if you're doing business in Cuba on property that belongs to one of our brethren here in the United States. So fix it, 
before you do business with us. And that company approached IT&T and paid them $24 million, not to buy the claim, but to buy peace. And they said, we're not going to, we, we acknowledge you're the owner. We know you're the owner, but we're willing to pay you money in order to be able to buy peace so we can finish our, our investments. The point of, what I, of, of that is that the property issue is well known to the investors. They know it's a problem in Cuba. They know it will continue to be uh, uh, a problem uh, in Cuba. So how does that manifest itself into some of the issues that we discussed today? The first thing that we heard was we should discuss whether or not we should have exports to Cuba. By and large, exports to Cuba, like the Farm Bureau selling uh, uh, and its members selling food to Cuba, not an issue. The selling of medicines to Cuba, not an issue. The problem is when Cuba wants to come back in the other direction. What does Cuba sell? Well, it sells rum, it sells cigars, it sells sugar. Guess who owned the rum brands in Cuba? Guess who owned the cigar brands in Cuba? Guess who owned the sugar in Cuba? Americans or Cuban Americans. So when you talk about how do we transition into a trade relationship with Cuba, who's going to own Bacardi in Cuba? Is it the Bacardi family or the Cuban government? Who's going to own Havana Club? Is it Ramon Arrechavala, in, uh, who, who runs a garage shop in, in, uh, in Miami because he was confiscated and didn't have resources outside of Cuba? Or is it going to be Pernod Ricard, who has knowingly entered into a 50-50 joint venture with the Cuban government. By the way, the Arrechavalas and the Bacardis called Pernod Ricard while they were doing that deal and said, don't do it, it's our property. And they said, sorry, business is business. And they went ahead and did the deal. So who's going to own that when the U.S. establishes trade with Cuba? And are they going to be able to sell it here in the United States? Who's going to own Partagas and Punch and Oil de Monterey and Monte Cristo and all the Cuban cigar brands? Those families left Cuba. They were confiscated in Cuba. Those brands are produced in Cuba and sold through a joint venture with a Spanish company called Altadas. The families came to the United States. The Cuban cigar companies, or the U.S. cigar companies, who were in business in Cuba, embraced them. They said, you used to be our competitor. You used to be uh, against us. We want to partner with you now. Let's, let's join up. We will keep your brands alive, and we will produce them in the United States. So those brands today are sold in the United States by American corporations who partnered with the victims of confiscation. In the rest of the world, they're sold by the corporations who invested with the confiscator. How is that going to be resolved? Sugar uh, is more of a commodity, so sugar is fungible. But the, at the end of the day, the properties are um, uh, most sugar production was in private hands in Cuba, and the property belonged either to an American companies or to uh, Cuban Americans. I want to talk a little bit about the tourism industry. I can understand why the tour operators want to get tourists to go to Cuba. They're going to be able to sell the tours from the United States. They're going to be able to make money on it. But how about the other side of it? How do the hotel companies deal with that issue? Are they going to be allowed into Cuba, or is the Cuban government saying, no, 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 I want the tourists, but I don't want you guys. I want to control it the way I do now. I want to have complete control over the employees, because I know Marriott and Starwood and um, Hilton and the rest of you are going to want to hire your own employees or want to pay them directly, because you're not going to violate the international labor standards that we got the Spaniards to violate. How is that? Uh, uh, going to work out. The tour operators want to sell, but the hotel operators have a much bigger issue. And if they go in and do it the way the Cuban government says they should do it, they're going to face the same kind of lawsuits that we just heard about. The PDVSA lawsuit, which was just filed in February, was a lawsuit that they actually did get served. I was talking to the lawyer who, who filed it. It was, as uh, Mr. Pignon said, the Cubans traded doctors for oil. Mm -hmm. So these guys were sent to Venezuela. Uh, they worked for basically slave labor. Uh, they were able to sign up with a lawyer who used the Alien Tort Claims Act to file a lawsuit against the, uh, uh, the Cuban government, the Venezuelan government, and PDVSA. Well, guess what? They're going to get jurisdiction over PDVSA. 
uh, because they own Seco Petroleum in the United States, and that federal court in Miami is going to exercise jurisdiction over them, and probably uh, they're going to have to defend. And as I understand it, they actually have made an appearance and are going to defend. So this is going to be a very interesting case because in mo most of the other cases, the Cuban government has defaulted uh, and then the judgment is entered. This one is going to be a pretty contested uh, uh, lawsuit. On the phones, we have sort of the same issue. The Cuban telephone system is owned by an American corporation. So how do you distribute, uh, how, do you, how do you invest in the Cuban telephone system uh, if the phone system belongs to, to an American claimant? And again, the same with power generation. You can generate the power, but the distribution system inside of Cuba belongs to an American corporation. Now, I keep saying it belongs to, and uh, let me elaborate on that. This is not a creature of U.S.-Cuba relations. The issue of the United States saying that government's confiscation of property is not to be tolerated or not to be recognized inside the United States goes back to the Russian Revolution. The case law on this subject developed when uh, immigrants from the Russian Revolution went to New York, were able to transfer bank accounts, were able to transfer certain assets, and then were able to argue with the uh, uh, representatives, if you will, of the, of, the, of the new Soviet government over who actually owned it. The, the Russian government wanted access to those bank accounts. Those families went to court and said, no, they belong to us. And the United States said, yes, it does. It belongs to you. We will not give effect to a, to a confiscation without compensation. That rule of law has been followed throughout the world. It was followed uh, through, uh, all throughout Europe. When, uh, as I think someone was commenting before, when the Nazis um, uh, confiscated Jewish properties, nothing could be done about it. And then the Soviets came in behind them, and those properties and those property claims sat dormant for years and years and years. But the Western European countries said, no, you don't. Those properties belong to the families who have fled to exile, and we will recognize them one day. In fact, the best case of all is if you go to any Sony camcorder, you will look on the side of it, and you'll see Carl Zeiss lens. Well, the Zeiss family was in what became Eastern Germany, and all of their properties and their factories were confiscated, including their intellectual property and their trademarks family fret fled to, to France, and, and starting in France and then throughout all of Western Europe, the government said, no, you don't. We won't give effect to those confiscations. They belong to the families, and we will um, uh, uh, respect them. When the Soviet bloc fell, all of those countries were then uh, required, not required, I think most of them, in fact, the countries that prospered the most were the countries that immediately went to restitution systems. In other words, to give the property back. The Czechs were the, f the first. And I want to read something, and, I, and it's short enough, I'm going to read it verbatim, that to this day sits on the State Department webpage with respect to property restitution in Central and Eastern Europe. And it says as follows. During World War II, the Nazis seized property, real and movable, from organizations and individuals which the Nazi regime was persecuting, Jews, members of some Christian organizations, Roma, homosexuals, and others. Much of that property in Western Europe was returned during the post-war period under occupation law in areas occupied by the Allies and under the laws of individual countries. This was not generally possible behind the Iron Curtain, where the newly established communist governments simply took over property seized earlier by the Nazis. Those governments also frequently confiscated additional property from their own citizens. The collapse of communism in 1989-91 made it possible to restitute property in the former Iron Curtain countries. Many countries enacted legislation to provide for the restitution of both private and communal property. The United States has strongly supported efforts to restitute to rightful owners property confiscated by the Nazis between 1933 and 1945 and by the subsequent communist governments of Central and Eastern Europe. And here's the, the crux of it and why I think it applies equally to Cuba. And, and this is in their context, and then the last line, I think, uh, uh, last two lines really apply to Cuba. With respect to all these countries, they said, positive action on property issues was one of the criteria used to judge the progress of countries that aspired to the North American Treaty Organization, or NATO, membership. 
the European Union also recognizes the relevance of property issues in, in applicant countries. A successful property restitution program is an indicator of the effectiveness of the rule of law in a democratic country. Non-discriminatory effective property laws are also of crucial importance to a healthy market economy. That's the reason I believe that Congress acted on Helms-Burton and why for years nothing has happened on, on this issue because the United States government knows that on the Cuba issue it is sending a message to the rest of the world. You can't take our property and expect us to just walk away and pretend it didn't happen. You will answer for it one day. That's why when Hugo Chavez started confiscating properties, he had to pay for it because he knew this was going to be the result. Now, let me touch a little bit upon the issue of, of, uh, of the labor issue as well. Uh, one of the speakers talked about hemispheric consistency. If you really look at our trade policy in, in, in the hemisphere, we have tried to get countries to go to uh, freer uh, market economies. We're trying to benefit, uh, or at least our policy is designed to try to push them to liberalize their economies, to do away with state enterprises, uh, and the like. We did that in NAFTA, we did that in CAFTA, that was the, always the master plan of the free trade area of the Americas. The, the reality is that as you listen to the debate on the Colombia Free Trade Agreement and the Panamanian Free Trade Agreement, what's this ultimate issue that you keep hearing is the sticking point? Labor rights and environmental rights. This administration is not going to do anything with Colombia as long as they perceive that Colombia's labor rights are not strong enough. Well, if they're not going to do it with Colombia, who is a strong ally of the United States, with whom we have a great trading relationship, how do we expect them to do it with Cuba and not send a signal to the rest of the world that they might as well just, you know, forget what we say because look at how, how we act? All of these issues that, that we started talking about here today, I want to give a plug to the Commerce Department, uh, and I know one of the representatives here today. Uh, but uh, the, during the Bush administration, there was something created, which was the Commission on Assistance to a Free Cuba. And in Chapter 4 of the first report, which I believe was in 2004, and then the second report was in 2006, they, they, they go through all of these issues. And it's very hard for them to come up with solutions. But what, they, what those two reports do, which I commend all of you to read, um, they identify all of these issues and all of the problems that are going to be faced. And until we, end, we start to address those kinds of issues, rather than, oh, let's just lift the embargo and forget the consequences on what it might have here or there, or keep the embargo no matter what, because I, that's equally as, as, as dangerous because there could be ways that you can actually cause positive change in Cuba. Until you start to discuss these real nitty-gritty issues, uh, I don't think we're going to see any progress. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Iggy. Well, we've certainly had a range of views across uh, the, the panelists. Um, I invite your comments and questions. Um, please wait for the microphone and, and identify yourself um, as, uh, as it comes to you. Um, start here with uh, with Chris I don't want to abuse my speaking role here having been a speaker and I'll be the first to ask a question but um, two questions two different panelists Ignacio first of all I mean, on the question of claims I mean I wonder at what point though have you considered that that honoring those claims actually is counterproductive to producing change in Cuba so let's take the case of, of telephones, or let's take the case of telecommunications investors who are very worried about being able to put in a cell phone, cell phone tower and find out that the property they put it on it was, will turn out to be confiscated property, and uh, they can't, they're going to face a suit. I mean, let's be, I assume you would agree with the principle that you know, giving Cubans the right to be able to communicate, honoring that right, right. Giving them the means to do that should actually trump some hoary, old, musty claims they date back 50 years. And by saying that, I'm not try arguing to violate sort of, you know, international standards on property rights. But but you know, it, it seems what you just outlined is a, is a is an argu argument for stasis, not uh, justice. 
No. Or certainly not. I've got another question. So certainly not, you know, and, and I just don't know where that ends. Um, and, and in fact, Texaco, I don't know if I'm betraying anything that Jorge, Texaco was willing to write those off. I mean, a lot of these claimants on the U.S. side are just willing to write them off for a new opportunity to invest. I can tell that firsthand. They, they don't care. I mean, it, I can tell you right now, Intercontinental Hotels, you still own the National Hotel. They're like, forget it. I mean, the thing's so run down, they don't want it. They would just rather go back in, reinvest. So we've sort of reified these these former holders as being some sort of victims, and yes, they are, but, but a lot of them, if you look at them one by one, they've made a far more pragmatic calculation. And I think the U.S. government should be doing the same pragmatic calculation when it comes to where to loosen this in terms of what it gets for Cuba. Second issue, uh, Steve, I'm just curious on, on the um, travel ban being left. And I understand William was saying, Bill was saying, you know, oh, it's a right for, Cuba, for Americans to travel to Cuba. I agree. I'm not, I'm not arguing that that should be controlled. But, you know, the, the exhortation around this right isn't getting us very far. Again, I'm not sure we're going to get. So the question is, is, have you sort of begun to look at and talk to people in the executive, in the licensing departments, and OFAC to say, look, you know, maybe we could nudge it this way or this way, you know, education, cultural travel, um, you know, allowing sort of ways that expand that scope that doesn't, that don't pin your hopes on a congressional bill that, uh, again, for whatever its merits, uh, looks unlikely to go anywhere. Uh, let's uh, take a, a couple of questions before we uh, go back to that. Um, Jorge in the back there. There's a number of U.S. brand corporations who are currently in Cuba. I think the issue is valid for land. I think agricultural land is going to be the biggest issue. But there's a lot of private corporations that I have spoken to, and I'm not mentioning any names, but they're saying our assets have actually a negative value. In the case of pollution, for example, we won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. And in fact, some companies are saying the opportunity cost, the future opportunity cost of us doing business in Cuba. And what th these corporations have said to me is, eventually it's going to be a commercial decision. In other words, the enterprise, the, the private company will tell our lawyers and whatever what, because eventually it's going to be a commercial decision, not a legal or a political decision. My question then is real quick, Ignacio. If, if, you move, if you put a political scenario in front of you and you fast forward 10, 15 years from now, uh, and the current regime is out, and there is a new regime who is going through the process of democracy and so on, Cuba today is bankrupt. Who's going to pay? Are the Cuban people for the next 10, 15 years are going to pay out of their own pockets uh, for generations to come this horrendous debt? And by the way, you failed to mention, uh, I think there's over $1 billion of lawsuits in Miami filed by Cuban families against Cuba. Who eventually, out of whose pocket is all of that money going to come out of? If, if I could follow that question uh, just directly on that, um, again for Iggy, is there the possibility that U.S. taxpayers, in fact, will pay? And, and I'm thinking more um, of, a, a, of the small kind of case where um, someone, uh, a, a Cuban, leaves the island and, um, you know, the house is taken over and there are current occupants, but they still have, you know, the key to the front door. Um, how do you resolve those kinds of claims and really who, who pays for them? Um, and I, I guess uh, as, a, as a precedent, I'm interested if, if you recall what happened um, in Nicaragua in terms of the property that had been taken by the Sandinistas, how compensation was arranged, and also how compensation was arranged in the case, say, of, of uh, uh, in, in the former Czechoslovakia, the, the, the victims of Nazi confiscations. We're, we're piling on, it no, seems. That's good. <laughs> Uh, Go ahead. Another, another. Uh, well, why don't we take these three questions and then we'll come back to. Uh, well, I'll, I'll add to that well. You'll add to that one. Okay, can, um, Jose, can you get the microphone? Well, I, I think part of part of the problem. This is one of the thornier issues that we're going to have to deal with. But what I think is important, independently of who pays for, uh, and we can look at the history of the thirty-some countries from f former Soviet Union that have transitioned, but. In order to go forward, it is indispensable to establish property rights by whatever mechanisms we have to establish property rights. But it is Im it, it's literally impossible to build a law-based state unless we somehow establish property rights by whatever mechanisms we may need to do that. Okay. Now... Uh we'll allow Iggy okay, to... Okay, great. No, uh, look, my, my job was to... Uh, 
do exactly this, which is to, to raise the issue. And, and I, like I said, we could go, you know, have an entire seminar on this issue. And believe me, the Florida Bar and many others have done so. But um, the, the last comment is really the key to the, to the, to the entire issue. The, the issue is one of establishing the rule of law. You know, I had written down three points that I think are critical for Cuba and why the issue of how to deal with the property uh, issue becomes important. One, respect for the rule of law, a culture of lawfulness, and the creation of in, an independent judiciary. Because if you have those and you look at Cuban law, now I wasn't a licensed Cuban lawyer, but I spent a lot of time studying Cuban law. Under Cuban law, at the time these confiscations took place, it was illegal to, to do what was done, not just to the American companies, but to the Cuban Americans. So, so you have the salutary effect of saying, okay, we're going to address the issue. And I think that that goes to, Chris, your, your comment, which is, why is this important? Why is it not stale? Because it, it, it helps to establish the rules of the game. And the biggest problem, I think, that, that occurs here is not coming up with creative solutions, but it's getting the Cuban government to say, I understand and I will sit at the table to come up with creative solutions. When you look at the 33 countries around uh, uh, that formed the, so the Soviet bloc, they all came up with, with solutions. By the way, in my view, the worst solutions were the ones where they paid uh, because they didn't have the money to pay. That's what happened in Nicaragua. That's what happened in Hungary, for instance. So those systems were seen as failures. There was no, the, the foreign investment in those countries never materialized like the governments would have wanted them to do. By contrast, the countries that went to restitution and said, I'm going to give it back, uh, those were the, company, the countries that prospered the most, the Czechs, the East Germans, uh, and the like. The Zeiss family recovered the factories. Uh, as bad as they were, there was an emotional tie to it, uh, to recover the factory, plant the flag. It was very curious to hear the first mover discussion. You know, if, if the Bacardis are the first one to return to Cuba, it sends a signal it's safe to come back because the Bacardis went back. Well, the Bacardis aren't going back until they get their property back. So those are the kinds of, of, of issues that, that, that will arise. So I don't think they're old. I don't think they're stale. I think that they, cr they, they are important <coughs> to, to dealing with the issue uh, going into the future to create the stability. Second point is the U.S. taxpayers are, have already paid for the claims. Everybody wrote them off. Uh, and the way the tax code is written, it says when you recover the property, not if you recover, it says when you recover the property, you will redo your taxes. By the way, this is free tax advice. You will redo your taxes as, and, and pay the back taxes that you otherwise would have paid had you not taken this deduction, plus interest coming forward. Nobody's doing that. Or you will treat it all as a capital gain. So, and, and in fact, it was that tax provision and the write-offs that caused the, um, uh, the Helms-Burton law to pass the constitutional test for having an impact in the United States. Why does Congress have the right to legislate? Well, because the acts that are, being, that are occurring had an impact in, in the United States and are hurting the ability to recover the money that for, for, the, for the U.S. taxpayer. And it wasn't just the Americans who wrote off the taxes. Cuban Americans wrote off the taxes. In fact, the losses for Cuban Americans were so large and offset against so little income at the beginning, and, and it's just a little digression here, once you became a tax resident, that means you didn't even have to be a citizen. If you were in the country and you were a tax resident, you now had to pay taxes in the United States. Well, you also were allowed to take losses in the United States. Well, all of the families were able to take those losses. Senator George Smathers at the time introduced legislation and he said the losses are so great that they can't do it over the five-year carryover period because they'll never have enough income to offset it. So the carryover period for losses for Cuban Americans was 20 years. Uh, so a lot of Cuban Americans didn't pay taxes until after 1980 mm -hmm. because the losses were so great. Uh, and the U.S. taxpayer had to absorb uh, all of that. So they've already paid uh, uh, in that uh, sense. And then with respect to the different companies, I am sure that there are companies who are going to walk away. I could see a Tex Texaco and an Exxon walking away from those refiners and saying, I don't want that nightmare. I could also see them saying, and you may have had conversations with them, I have not, well, I'm not so sure about walking away. If I have a beachhead 90 miles off the eastern seaboard and I know I'm not going to get a refinery in the United States anytime soon, probably never in the next 100 years, I may just want to really think about what kind of tax incentives and brownfield 
issues I can have. And if I can get a beachhead there, I may want that beachhead. Yeah. So. Go ahead. Let me pick up on uh, Chris's question. I think it's a very sophisticated discussion that impacts any branch of the government when all of these issues get out on the table. There's only, uh, there's only so much oxygen in Washington, D.C. and around the country. And to elevate the discussion like we have today is really a dramatic way to get everybody who might have a stake in it to listen. Uh, I know I've learned a lot here today uh, about uh, the various issues and in some ways from a, uh, different uh, approaches to some of the things I've heard but not in as much depth or with as much eloquence. But I have to go back to my little story about being in Florida. I happened to be there because I had a leftover ticket uh, from here to Florida and I chose to use it during the Mother's Day period to see my mother who lives in Florida. And the reason I had the ticket is that I had been invited to a similar discussion of issues on Cuba to be hosted by the Miami Chamber of Commerce, which through local pressure was canceled. And it was canceled because people didn't want any discussion of the issues the way we've done it here today. So uh, my answer to you is we need to keep the discussion going so that people get what the nuances and some of the hard issues are so that we can get them out and discuss them. And I think also that that member of Congress who sought me out did so because he had to get uh, prepared for a vote that was coming and whether it was going to get passed or not, he was compelled to be a little more informed. So I think what we're doing here today is the answer to the question that you raised. And there is somebody here from OFAC. You know, a lot of times, uh, you know, we've tried to do it in a way to, you know, just raise the visibility. And uh, the very first thing that our group did, uh, NTA, uh, and working with our uh, sister organization, the United States Tour Operators Association, and with some of the people in the Cuba uh, Roundtable, we set up a day of media interviews with people in the travel trade press, consumer trade press, and including uh, an interview on Univision and another one with uh, El Dario de la Prensa in New York with Congressman Sam Farr just to raise the visibility so that the issue would be on the table. So I think we're going the right way. And you know, yes, we're talking to all the different players in the executive branch and Congress and so on, but it's getting that discussion up to the point where people are paying attention that's more important than you know, trying to talk to the right level bureaucrat and you know, trying to work things. It's kind of like the old story about President Roosevelt talking to somebody on a piece of legislation, um, and, the, and the guy said to uh, Roosevelt, um, are, you on, are you with me on this issue? And he said, yes, now go out and convince me to sign it. So I think that's where we are. If, if can I, I, can I add sure. something ahead, to that Chris. real quick? Um, we talk to anybody we can to about this issue, and OFAC obviously is key because they are the ones that are monitoring the regulations and the sales and everything else that kind of goes on. I think it's important to remember that this issue does not operate in a policy vacuum. There is just as much politics that are at play with this um, as any other issue that's out there. OFAC has the latitude at this point with the blessing of the White House to make changes to any of these regulations. Um, but what we have found is that because of the politics that are at play, it, it hasn't happened. I mean, everything that we've seen done so far has been because Congress has said, you're going to change it. You know, we, U.S. agriculture, we can travel to Cuba now for agricultural sales. We had to do so on a specific license, not until the law changed, until legislation was passed, that now are we allowed to travel on a general, general license. Right now, we have this reprieve from the cash payment issue for the fiscal year of 10. OFAC has done a great job in actually getting that regulation out immediately. Do they have the authority to extend it beyond OFAC? or beyond FY10, absolutely. But they have followed the letter of the law. And again, it's because it is policy mixed with the politics. And so I think it takes this drive from Congress in order to make it happen. I don't think the administration wants to stand out there alone 
in making these policy decisions. They did things that they could. They changed the travel for Cuban Americans traveling. They changed the remittance issue. Those were things that they could easily get out there. I think these issues, though, are a little bit more difficult as we're seeing the challenges are in trying to even get a piece of legislation through Congress at this point. Let, let me add to this, because I, I at, the, at the end of the Clinton administration, they created the general licenses for numerous categories. And I agree with you 100%. There is, and, I, and I'm a big advocate of purposeful travel. Uh, you know, not the tourist who's just going to go sit on Varadero Beach, but someone who's going uh, for that cultural exchange, someone who's going for educational re purposes. So they had all these categories. And what was occurring was that you were having someone who say, oh, I'm going to um, for an educational exchange or I'm going for research and the person would go and do one day's worth of something and then spend seven days on Varadero Beach. Well, that's what led to the Bush administration saying it's over because it's being roundly abused. Or, or you'd get someone who was going saying, I'm going down to sell them chickens, but they'd do a meeting or two and then spend the, the week. I'm not saying that that's what everybody was doing, but that's what was happening. And that's what led in large part to pulling, pulling it back. My, my personal reaction uh, uh, experiences, and I've done a lot of licenses with OFM, but that's my experience with OFAC. If you give them the details, and they know what's happening, they're going to give you the authority to do it. Perhaps uh, Jose Raul and I can, can comment on that. Um, the Wilson Center had was denied um, a license under the previous administration mm -hmm. um, to carry out academic activities that involved uh, Cuban scholars. So, I mean, I think a lot of it... it you it didn't just have the right lawyer. Well, it, it, <laughs> it reinforces, I think, the point that, that what happens on a technical... Uh, at a technical level is very much driven by, you know, the broader sort of policy agenda. We have a, a we had a couple of hands, I think, uh, here, um, Mark, and, and there. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, I have a couple questions for Chris. Ax Mark, Mark Sullivan from Congressional Research Service. Um, yeah. Chris, um, in terms of the payment in cash in advance issue, since Congress had made the change, you know, for this fiscal year, why is it uh, that the Cubans aren't y utilizing that? Is it an ideological stand? Is it or, or what? Uh, and also, in terms of the legislation, um, what uh, there's been a lot of talk of perhaps uh, taking the travel provisions out. Uh, what, do, what what are your perspectives on that? Uh, you know, in other words, if the how difficult would it be for the agricultural provisions to, to fly? Right here, if you just want to pass the mic across the uh, across the aisle, was there a hand? Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's already dated. So, but Mr. Sanchez, uh, I'm Cuban born, and my house has been uh, well. We left our home, and it has been lived at by the American uh, interest interest section for 50 years. We have yet to receive a, uh, a rental. Uh, payment from them. <laughs> I did. I did uh, email the State Department, and there's no uh, answer to my emails. Anybody want to take this on? Hey, I'll take it, uh, on. <laughs> it awaits broader legislation, right? The, the green light, and over here, sure. Bill. John McAuliffe, Fund John, for Reconciliation right. and Development. Um, as was said in the earlier panel, and as our current ambassador to Mexico wrote, uh, and as Bob Muse has argued, um, virtually all of Helms-Burton could be waived by the executive based on national interest. Um, laws which are passed can be repealed, so it's nothing written in stone. Um, the Cubans have said quite clearly that they regard unilateral economic aggression of the embargo or blockade as legally challengeable and financially challengeable in terms of the damage to them. So I think this whole post-normalization process is going to be a lot of going back and forth. Um, property, U.S. property in Vietnam, in Cambodia, how those things get solved are part of the political context and the desire to solve them on both sides. I mean, the Cubans have have indicated a willingness to find ways of compensating. Um, 
I want to say very specifically, the New York Philharmonic was denied a license for members of the Philharmonic Society. Under the Clinton rules, they would have gotten that license. Um, the, I am totally prepared to do a full-blown non-tourist travel campaign if it's a general license, because the moment you put it into specific license process for OFAC is the moment that you basically kill the potential of it. The virtue of ending all travel restrictions is the unpredictability of it. Is it the businessman from Dubuque who goes and figures out a partner and something he can do? It's the NGO or the local community association doesn't quite know what they want to do in Cuba, but can go and can find something that they can do. Now, again, if general licenses were offered the way Cuban Americans got general licenses, that's fine. For a year or two, we could do a tremendous amount, but and it's not going to have any significant economic impact in Cuba, but it would have a tremendous difference. Um, but I don't know that we have the political power of getting those general licenses, and we may have have the political power to get the legislation through, and and until that is played out, I think I'd put the the you know the administration could have done it for the last year and hasn't, and I just don't see that they're going to. Um, so I you know I think the other thing that hasn't been touched on is what happens to Cubans if travel restrictions end. Now a lot of money does go to the state, and it gets recycled back into buying product from the United States, but a lot of it goes to taxi drivers who now essentially lease their own cabs and charge whatever they want regardless of what's on the meter and don't have to pay the state enterprise anything except the monthly re <coughs> rental. Uh, it'll go to Paladares, to the expansion of private restaurants. It'll go to Casas Particulares, filling in the space that the, that the state tourist sector can't provide. I mean, Chris talked earlier about Vietnam. Vietnam, a year into becoming president, Clinton lifted the embargo. The only condition that that was related to was POW MIA. It had nothing to do with internal economics or internal politics in Vietnam. It had to do with a very specific bilateral issue. And opening that door then opened all kinds of other doors within Vietnam. People who say that Vietnam and China are authoritarian and totalitarian, sure, that's true. But they're very different places, both of them, than they were 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago in terms of intellectual space, personal space, political debate. It doesn't formalize yet, but you have something that's happened. And at this point, nothing happens unless the deluge or the collapse, the apocalypse. And, and that, uh, you know, in, in some of the remarks in the first panel in this, there is this sense that people, that we're talking to the British Tories, complaining about all the property, complaining about their authority, complaining about all they lost after the American Revolution. History changes things. If you want to influence where Cuba goes today, you open the door and you do it in a normal influence way. You don't do it by essentially trying to continue a war that's been over for 50 years. Okay, I think we have uh, time for one or two last uh, questions. Um, here, uh, Jose Raul, Chris, any other people that haven't spoken? Okay, last round. I'm Gisela Garcia Tuñon, I'm a Cuban American, and the question is for Chris. Um, my brother is president of a shipping company from Japan. He's been trading for Cuba all these years. They have ships into Cuba all the time, and the embargo, you know, they trade all the time. Most of the companies, Cuba owes them a lot of money, millions and millions of money that they do not pay. Was that the case with, your, with uh, Cuba paying you, or did they pay you for all the shipments? We'll, we'll, we'll wait on that. We'll, we'll wait. Uh, Jose Raul? Thanks. Uh, I just had a, a couple of questions. Actually, my first question was actually, uh, I think Mark asked it regarding um, uh, to what extent 
because uh, it was to Chris, do you, you, you talked about the travel provision being the most controversial part of the bill, et cetera, et cetera, and to what extent uh, the Farm Bureau was considering, or folks surrounding the law were considering decoupling the two issues because the moving, moving on ag sales seems to be much less controversial and progress is progress regardless of how we, we see it. The other question I have is, uh, it goes in part to Joel and, 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 and Iggy and maybe it's kind of like a not precisely formed question but I just want to reflect on this. You were talking about international obligations and the precedent the United States might be setting regarding rule of law and regarding obligations under international treaties, especially in terms of U.S. companies that would do business in Cuba that would be subjected to lawsuits, etc. You know, Cuba is a member of the WTO, and under WTO rule, the embargo violates U.S. obligations under the GATT agreement. Uh, and this is an issue that has been brought in Geneva repeatedly. And it doesn't really form part of a repertoire of issues that we address in our interpretation of the policy and how it works in terms of not only of our relations with Cuba, but also in terms of our international trade commitment. And I was wondering if you, if any, if you two, uh, in particular, but anybody in the panel could make a comment about this, uh, whether it's an idea that has any traction, or whether, how it's relatable to the argument you are making regarding international obligations and rule of law. Chris Sabatini. Just, just very quickly, I mean, uh, John mentioned the case of Vietnam, and you know, there actually is an interesting case in Vietnam, too, where there are outstanding um, debt obligations the Vietnamese government had sort of inherited, where they, oddly enough, the, the South Vietnamese government owed the U.S. government money for the war that the U.S. government lost that was fighting for South Vietnam. Anyway, they, then they insisted those debt claims were still outstanding by the time the embargo was lifted. But it goes to the point, though, that I want to raised with, with Iggy is that you know, in that particular case what they did was something very interesting was basically they created a joint fund that allowed for Vietnamese students coming to the United States to study and it it, it, it honored sort of what I think is all, all in that case a questionable uh, ob debt obligation on the part of the Vietnamese government that it was forced to inherit that aside though what it did was it actually created a way of building bridges between the societies and I want to you know I respect you coming here and talking about it you did a great job but you know what I don't hear a lot of is people thinking and t talking creatively about what can be done to resolve these property issues. Maybe it's not now, but you know, there are a whole host of opportunities. Why not create a secondary market for these property claims? Allow some of these companies who just want to wash their hands of them to sell them for like 10,000 bucks. Put that in a, in a general fund and establish a scholarship fund for Cubans to be able to come to the United States now or whenever they want to to study. And they can, you know, Again, it opens the door for the sort of travel, but I just don't hear that level of creative thinking coming from people who are very much stuck in the static idea of these are property claims, and damn it, we got to resolve them. So I'm just thanks. Since you slammed me earlier, I was talking about how it's going to throw the hell. Okay. Can I just say one? Can I just say one very, very quickly? Yeah. Another American, Cuban American. Most of us do not care about our homes that taken care of, and we would like to give them to the Cuban people who have really suffered throughout the years. In my home, there are 40 kids living right there, and we have no expectations. That's their home, and we do not want that. What we do not want is somebody, you know, using the rest. We want to help the Cuban people. We do not want the Cuban people not to have any access, but we want the Cuban government to not to, um, um, how do you call them? abuse, you know, the political prisoners and all the labor people. Okay. All right. Let's have uh, a last round of comments from each of our speakers, uh, starting with Chris. I'll touch on the, the, the payment issue first. Yes, Cuba has awful credit. I mean, Cuba cannot pay the credit, which is one of the reasons why we're not offering Cuba credit. Cuba pays to the United States in cash. If Cuba does not have the cash, then there is no contract. So that, that one's fairly easy. In regards to the GATT comment, WTO, Cuba can challenge us in the WTO. Cuba will win. What you win is retaliation. We don't trade anything with Cuba. So there's nothing for them to put in place. I mean, typically what you would do is increase the tariffs on U.S. imports going into the country. There's nothing there. So it would be a symbol. Um, but, it, you know, the UN vote has been no more of a symbol to put pressure on us than, than a case in the WTO would be if we would end up losing that. So, I mean, I, I don't see that there would be much value, value in that. Um, in regards to the cells and of themselves, um, no, you're, you, we won't see any 
contracts under this FY10 lifting of the cash in advance definition because it is only for a year. Um, there is no long-term uh, benefit to it, and so a company is not going to want to try to scramble to get that contract done before the end of the year. Um, so it, it just, because it's only a year provision, we've only kind of seen it as, as a great symbol that, you know, Congress understands the issue. But as far as it being usable, it, it's not because, again, it, it's only, it's short term. I mean, as far as a company goes in making business decisions and determining what type of contracts we're going to have out in the future with Cuba, they, they can't base that off of, off of this one year lifting of, of the cash in advance definition. Um, and then regarding the travel provision and taking out the travel provision, no. I mean, we kind of see this as a full package and um, we want to make sure that travel is included um, in that. As I said, we feel that lifting of the travel provision is just as much an agricultural provision as the cash in advance issue and the third country banking issue. I'd just like to pick up on that one point. Uh, I can't be more complimentary of the agricultural community and how firmly they've stood that uh, it's all one bill. And I think that Chairman Peterson and his staff uh, could have uh, brought this to a vote a lot earlier if they wanted to try and do it without the travel provision and they're holding firms uh, as well. So uh, I think in terms of this piece of legislation, uh, all the people that matter see it as one combined piece of legislation and they're not going to move uh, without that. And I think that's why <coughs> the vote on the markup has been postponed until they get enough votes to pass it uh, inclusively. And it's been a pleasure to be with you know, such a uh, great group of folks in a previous panel as well. And I'm uh, very thankful I had a chance to participate. Bueno, yo creo que hay principios básicos, elementales, hay... Un momento para que ponga su Se usa para todo. Yo creo que hay principios básicos, elementales, y hay normas internacionales y de responsabilidad social corporativa que las empresas deben cumplir en un proceso de inversión. Pero más que nada yo creo que hay principios éticos y morales que deben ser respetados cuando uno hace una inversión en un país. Y yo creo que a los trabajadores cubanos les interesa, le interesaría también en un futuro conocer que las inversiones extranjeras que se vayan a realizar cumplen sus principios éticos y morales también. No solamente los legales que están sobre la mesa y a los cuales están obligadas, obligados a cumplir aquellas empresas que inviertan en Cuba y que también cumplen en sus países de origen y que de forma muy eh, cínica uh, violan bajo la legislación cubana en sus inversiones en Cuba. Uh, Three, three points that I jotted down on, on the questions. First one on the WTO. Um, there's actually been two WTO cases uh, brought against the United States uh, on the Cuba issue. When Helms-Burton was passed, uh, the European Union brought a WTO case against uh, the United States. And the United States invoked the national security exception and said, do you really want to take this battle on or not? And everybody stood down uh, from, from, from that issue. Uh, the second one was a case brought as a result of the Havana Club uh, case and the legislation that uh, was passed that said that the United States would not give, uh, would not allow the Cubans or, or any of its business partners the ability to register a confiscated trademark in the United States. Just by way of context, the embargo has always had an, a reciprocal exception. U.S. can register intellectual property in Cuba, Cuba can register intellectual property here but it didn't say Cuba could, to, could register confiscated intellectual property here. So the law was changed when Bacardi was in the litigation on the Havana Club case to say that. Uh, what was interesting about the result of that, it went all the way to the appellate panel, is that they said that principle is correct. That's what the WTO ruled. There's been a lot of misinformation with respect to that case saying the United States lost. Uh, the United States ha had 25, points asserted against it, it won on all of them except one. What they said was the law is not stiff enough uh, because when you said it, you should have said the, the Cubans, its business partners, nor any U.S. entity can register a confiscated trademark. If you had done that, it would have been correct because the principle of not giving effect to uh, uh, 
uh, confiscations is a proper one, and they had no choice. They had done it themselves. All the, the, the points that I was raising before were fully briefed by USTR in that WTO case. That's where I learned the majority of that case law in, in Western Europe. Uh, so th that's on the WTO side. The travel provision uh, being the most controversial. Um, it is, uh, and it is because there is a sense that if it passes, it's game over. Uh, that's what the Cubans want, or at least there's a perception by some that that's what the Cuban want, Cubans want. If they get the American tourists, if they get that cash flow, nobody else from the United States is getting in. Uh, that they'll, they'll, they'll seal it off, they'll maintain their control, and the argument is that, that in essence, that just enhances their, their repression. As Joel said earlier, if you are a laborer and you want to have access to non-Cuban pesos, if you want to have access to the euro in the old days, if you wanted access to Cuba, you wanted to work in the hotels. You wanted to work, but you had to get through the Checkpoint Charlie into Varadero Beach. You had to be a good communist to get that job. If you protested, if you stood up for your rights, if you said, I don't agree with this, I want freedom, I want whatever, you lost that job. So your kids didn't get that milk. That's, by the way, there's a whole argument about why does Cuba have the libreta, why does it have the ration book? It had it before the embargo was put in place uh, because it's a means of control. Uh, and it, it was in place before the embargo was put in place. So the, the, um, the, uh, that's why a lot of members are not willing to take that jump yet because they, they see that that could be a major payoff and then will the government entrench. It could go the other way. It could, it could be that it sweeps in radical change. But are they willing to take that gamble? No, they're not willing to take that gamble. On the third point, uh, creative solutions. There are many, many, many creative uh, solutions. And I'll, I'll just give you an example. Uh, Latvia uh, actually addressed residential properties in, a, in an interesting way. It said, you can't kick anybody out of the house. <coughs> but the fact is the state is not going to be the owner of these properties. And most of the people know that these properties weren't, weren't theirs. And by the way, a lot of them are crumbling, and a lot of them want the landlord to fix them, and we, the government, don't have the resources to fix them. So you know what? You're the owner of the property, and we're going to balance how we tax you with rent controls, and we're going to impose leases for 10 years to allow you to fix the buildings up, fix the house up, fix whatever, uh, but the government created a board that actually balanced the interest of the tenant with the interest of the owner and how the government policy developed on the two. Pretty creative solution in, in, uh, in, in my book because it actually would have created greater incentives for the owner to invest in the property, to upgrade the property, which the government was never going to do and didn't have the money to do. So that's just one example. A lot of the claimants, a lot of the companies, not to mention the Cuban Americans, because all the Cuban Americans have a plan. <laughs> but, but a lot of the companies have plans as well. And I think the, the, the issue will be one is how is the issue addressed eventually by the Cuban government. Most governments are not in the business of running these enterprises. They're not in the business of being the landlords. They're not in the business of, of owning the assets. So as they privatize, how are they going to, how are they going to work in the claimant? Does the claimant in a privatization get a certain amount of you know, chips in the, in, for, for, to put into the pot, get sort of a leg up as, as part of a negotiation? There, there are all many, there are numerous ways of, of dealing with the issue. What I personally believe uh, is that nobody should be able to assert a claim just to land bank it because what the Cuban people need is a productive economy. And if you're going to go back and claim a property, then you better put it to work and you better generate jobs, and you better generate income, and you better generate benefits, not through the Cuban state enterprise, contracting directly with the laborers, allow the unions to, to establish themselves, work with them, but make it a productive engine uh, in the economy. As long as that's the case, I'm a big <coughs> proponent in restitution of property so that, so that, it, so that the private sector generates uh, economic benefit for the benefit of the Cuban people. Okay, it's been a long afternoon, but I think an extremely stimulating um, and provocative one. I thank all of you for your attention. I th especially thank uh, Chris.
Chris and Steve and, and Joel and, and Iggy for their presentations. Um, the video of this event will be on our website um, in, with all due speed, and we will be producing a summary of it. Um, thank you very much for joining us.